Today, Germany is one of the leading nations in a powerful European Union. Thanks to thriving exports, which include everything from automobiles to beer, it boasts the third largest economy in the world. In the more than six decades since the end of World War II, there is little evidence of the carnage and devastation that scarred the German people. Berlin is a city more eager to move forward than to look back. And it was here, in Berlin, that Academy Award-winning screenwriter Christopher McQuarrie was visiting on a business trip. I was in Berlin in early 2002, and I had hired a tour guide to take me around the city. And we spent most of the afternoon uh, looking at all the monuments and going through the city's history. The tour guide uh, had lived in Berlin all of his life, and he was 14 years old when World War II ended and had this remarkable sense of the city's history over the last 60 years. And the last place that he took me after having gone all over the city was to a place called Stauffenbergstrasse. What was inside was this building in a courtyard called the Bendler Block. And if you go inside that courtyard, there's an iron railing in the cobblestones. And not far from the iron railing is a plaque with five names on it. And those five men were the conspirators who were involved in an attempt to assassinate Adolf Hitler. It's actually where they were executed. And they are the only soldiers who served in World War II who are commemorated here in Berlin. When I was growing up, they didn't say we were fighting Germany, we were fighting the German army. It was always phrased as fighting the Nazis. And so the assumption became that anyone wearing that uniform and anyone marching under that flag was a Nazi. And that had been presented to us over and over and over again with all the World War II movies that we grew up on. Im, und in gewisser Hinsicht sind eben die Gestalten des Dritten Reiches äh, eben, eben schon so Comicfiguren geworden, die beliebig aufrufbar sind und so als sozusagen als, als äußerste Droge des Schreckens verwand, verwendet werden können. So ähnlich wie, wie es einst dieses schreckliche Klischee vom ewigen Juden gegeben hat, so ist denkbar, sagen manche Leute, dass das Klischee des ewigen Deutschen in die Welt gekommen ist, der nun für alle Zeiten assoziiert wird mit jemand, der auf diese Weise grausam und autoritär entgleisen kann. Now, when German young people, if they go to other countries, very often they are received with Heil, here come the Nazis, which is very difficult for a 15 or 16 or 17 year old boy or girl to accept because they really have nothing to do with it. Their parents probably had nothing to do with it. But it still sticks to the Germans. Understandably, the Germans have been held responsible for the actions of their leader, although most of them really didn't have a chance to do much about it. And those who did ended up in concentration camps or on the scaffold. And um, I think one ought to understand that what happened in Germany was the failure of the democratic institutions in 1933. And this is the great failure in German history. The great failure that brought the Nazi regime to power had its beginning on June 28, 1919, when Germany signaled its defeat in World War I by signing the Treaty of Versailles. As part of the terms, the Allies demanded that Germany surrender more than 13% of its territory and also limit the size of its army. Additionally, the country was burdened with a crippling war debt at a time when many Germans were starving. Within a decade, the country was thrust into a devastating economic depression one that saw the rise of numerous political parties battling for control. Germany, until 1918, was a monarchy. After 1918, it was a republic. But it was not a republic loved by the people who lived here in Germany. By the early 1930s, competition between the political parties was escalating, 
and two particularly bitter rivals took center stage, the German Communist Party and the National Socialist Party, led by Adolf Hitler. Praktisch um einen Kampf zwischen den Nazis oder den Kommunisten. Die Kommunisten kannte man von Hamburg, von München, von Berlin, wo sie Leute ermordet hatten. Die Nazis waren einem auch nicht sympathisch. Aber es gab keine andere Wahl. Die bürgerlichen Parteien waren zerschlagen und zerstritten. Es gab 50 Parteien, es gab keine Mehrheit mehr. There was political crisis from the year 1930 to 1933. Hitler was seen by the people as a savior. He was seen by the people as a man who could save Germany. His brilliant strategy was that he always had something for everybody. He could, uh, he could for instance, claim that he likes the little man, but he was also saying to the big industrialists, I'm going to the only man who will save you from communism. You had a very astute, very shrewd organizer who knew what he wanted, explained it in great detail to the German public, financed his party largely by charging admission for people to hear him speak. And eventually, with the support of people around the president, was able to get into power. On January 30th, 1933, under the influence of his advisors, a frail 85-year-old President Hindenburg gave the oath of office to Adolf Hitler and named him Chancellor of the German Reich. One month later, a fire broke out at the Reichstag, home to Germany's parliament. Hitler pointed his finger at the communists. It was the beginning of the end. He said, okay, everyone who is not for us is against us. So they decided uh, that all these people who fought against Hitler were thrown out of the German society. And about 100,000 were arrested, put into torture centers, makeshift concentration camps. It's often forgotten that the legal system, the courts and the police were the main way in which resistance was dealt with. They were simply beaten, intimidated, arrested into silence. After Hindenburg's death in 1934, the German cabinet, now firmly under Hitler's control, passed a law abolishing the presidency. Hitler became the supreme commander of the military and gave himself the additional title of Führer, or leader. Hitler used the occasion to have the entire armed forces, army, navy, as well as the air force, swear a personal oath of obedience and loyalty to him as a person, not to the nation, not to the constitution. So if anyone acted in any way against Hitler, then he would be committing treason. Now the supreme leader of the German nation, Adolf Hitler was free to pursue his goals of nationalism, territorial expansion, and cleansing the country of anything he viewed as non-German most particularly the Jews. In 1933, 
he had established the Reich Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda under Joseph Goebbels. Das ewige Gesetz der Natur, die Rasse rein zu halten, ist für alle Zeiten das Vermächtnis der nationalsozialistischen Bewegung an das deutsche Volk. Using the pseudoscience of eugenics, an 18th century philosophy which advocated selective breeding as a means of strengthening the human species, Goebbels and the Nazis launched an extensive and elaborate assault in the public media and in medical journals, arguing that Jews, homosexuals, and other non-Aryans were not only politically and socially undesirable, but genetically and biologically dangerous. We see that here a pest herd liegt, that the health of the Arish people is Richard Wagner had einmal said, Der Jude ist der plastische Dämon des Verfalls der Menschheit. Und diese Bilder bestätigen die Richtigkeit seines Ausspruchs. Hour after hour, day after day, year after year, the German public was force-fed a steady diet of lies, intolerance, and paranoia. Now racism and even genocide seem scientifically justified and even necessary. And if anyone dared to question or object, it would be considered an act of treason, and they were likely never heard from again. So great was Nazi propaganda against the Jews. School books, school lessons, cinema, radio, the media, newspapers, pouring it out all the time, that people came to believe there was a Jewish problem, if you like, and to uh, think that the, the influence of the Jews, which the Nazis vastly exaggerated, should be curbed in some way. Das ist keine Religion und kein Gottesdienst mehr. Das ist eine Verschwörung gegen alles Nichtjüdische. Die Verschwörung einer krankhaft hinterlistigen, vergifteten Rasse gegen die Gesundheit der arischen Völker und gegen ihr moralisches Gesetz. The Jews in Germany were concentrated in the law, in banking and finance, and so they were an easily identifiable group. But what really brings out anti-Semitism is the defeat of the First World War. Hitler and people on the far right, the nationalist right, uh, came to believe that the Jews had conspired in Germany to undermine the war effort. That's what drives anti-Semitism. It's the, the desire of Hitler and the leading Nazis to stop this happening again, as they see it, this conspiracy theory they believe in. In our house, where I lived, I saw these torchlight processions, and there was a force there that was frightening, and they had these choruses, uh, Perish Judah. And the Jew was the scapegoat for all evil. On September 15, 1935, the Reichstag passed the Nuremberg Race Laws, which deprived German Jews of their civil rights. Already in the mid-1930s, when I was a kid, you would see signs at restaurants and movie houses and so on, Jews not admitted. And unless people are accustomed to think of constitutionally protected rights, and most Germans weren't, the fact that others, people you think of as others, are persecuted, are beaten, are killed, have their property stolen, doesn't alarm that many people. But Jews weren't the only group threatened with persecution. Hitler also targeted the powerful Catholic Church. The Catholic Church agreed to a treaty with the National Socialist government, but it was trampled upon by the National Socialists. Some priests spoke out, but they soon disappeared. The same is more or less true for the Protestant churches. The National Socialists tried to infiltrate them and take them over uh, through National Socialist bishops and ministers. Angered by the blending of church and state, a group of Protestant ministers banded together to found the Confessing Church in 1933. Under the leadership of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, it was one of the first organized efforts to resist Hitler's policies. They constituted about a third 
of the Protestant clergy, and they rejected the National Socialist racial doctrines and the National Socialist doctrines of violence and materialism. That led to Dietrich Bonhoeffer being arrested and being forbidden to speak publicly and to preach, so that by 1938, he was practically silenced. Bonhoeffer would eventually be executed, but not before he and the Confessing Church managed to help more than 2,000 Jews escape the country, a country that continued to go mad. Hitler's ability to silence all voices of opposition seemed unstoppable. But despite this, some seeds of resistance continued to grow, and many of them were about to be found inside the Fuhrer's own army. By 1937, Hitler and his Nazi regime had taken full control of Germany. And now, the Fuhrer was setting his sights beyond the country's borders. On the 5th of November, 1937, Hitler announced his plans uh, for taking over uh, Czechoslovakia and Austria. When it became clear that Hitler was steering toward war, a high-level military opposition got organized, led by the chief of the general staff of the army, General Ludwig Beck. Ludwig Beck, like a lot of the generals, he wasn't really a Nazi. He was a conservative Prussian military um, officer who lived his entire life, as most of them had, within the confines of the military. Beck fought against Hitler. He wrote to Hitler, he made uh, speeches, he said, OK, we want no war. But Beck resigned in the year 1938 uh, because of Hitler's plans to make war. And after that, he becomes, uh, in retirement, a figure around whom a lot of the generals coalesce because he's very highly respected um, and somebody they look to as a, 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 almost, almost like a father figure in a way. And Beck it was supported by people like the head of intelligence, Admiral Wilhelm Canaris, and the tipping point that put the opposition into being uh, was the threat of war. In September 1938, there was the first plans for a coup d'etat against Hitler. Beck's group said, OK, Let's get him, let's bring Hitler into jail, and we will try him. But at the Munich conference in 1938, any anti-war momentum that might have helped the military remove Hitler from office was lost. Because it was here that the nations of France, Britain, and Italy allowed Germany to annex the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. And the whole German population was happy. No war and a new part, new living space for Germanys without a war. Hitler was the greatest for Germany at that time. And at that time, the German population was not behind a coup d'etat. And the officers, they decided after the Munich conference, no coup d'etat. So in the year 1939, you have no really military opposition against Hitler. But any further dreams of a peaceful German expansion were soon shattered when Hitler invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939. Two days later, France and Britain declared war. The Allied forces proved no match for the German war machine. Within a year, Hitler had invaded and conquered Denmark, Norway, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and France. Initially, the military resistance was what you might call pragmatic and nationalist. They thought that Hitler was simply driving Germany into ruin, and they wanted to stop that because they thought that they weren't ready for war. And after that, then, in 1939, 1940, uh, of course, the build-up of German arms is so great 
that it enabled the generals to win a lot of very major successes. So the military opposition really died down. Unfortunately, Hitler's military successes provided political cover for even more restrictive laws and ever more severe punishments. For instance, the men in the street, the women in the street, the refusal to uh, use the Hitler salute uh, was a form of resistance during the war that carried the death penalty. Or for spreading a rumor, or for listening to foreign radio stations. The Gestapo often registered that kind of activity. Among the few who dared risk imprisonment or death at the hands of the Gestapo were a series of small and largely ineffectual dissident groups. These were usually comprised of intellectuals, socialists, members of the clergy, aristocrats, and academics. One such group, based at the University of Munich, was the White Rose. Its members included young students like Sophie Scholl, her brother Hans, and Christoph Probst. United by Christian beliefs of tolerance and nonviolence, the White Rose protested the curbing of individual freedoms under the Nazi regime. The White Rose distributed anti-Nazi pamphlets. This uh, group, of course, had to remain as secretive as they could. When you organize resistance in a police state, in a totalitarian dictatorship, it's not advisable to tell too many uh, other people about it, because then stool pigeons, then spy, Gestapo spies are very quickly going to get you. On February 18, 1943, Sophie, Hans, and Christoph were arrested, tried for treason, and within four days, beheaded. Only after they had been murdered by the Nazis was uh, their identity known to Germany and to the world, and British bomber planes dropped not only bombs, but also reprints of their anti-Nazi pamphlets honoring their courage. Perhaps one of the most influential figures in the civilian resistance was Karl Friedrich Gödeler. The former mayor of Leipzig, Gödeler had resigned in protest over the Nazi demolition of a monument to the famed Jewish composer Felix Mendelssohn. He was an active resistor even after his resignation as mayor. And eventually he became recognized because he was the most dynamic and the most resolute civil leader among the resistance. Gödel and his circle were mostly aristocratic and wanted to restore Germany and a Germany that they imagined or remembered from their youth. So their plans said that Germany be run on a fairly authoritarian and hierarchical line with more power to be given to what they called the traditional ruling elite. Another secret resistance group, comprised largely of aristocrats, was the Kreisau Circle. They took their name from the estate where they would meet, home to one of its leading members, Helmut James von Moltke. The Kreisau Circle were against an assassination of Hitler. They thought that would be immoral. But the Kreisau Circle believed that however good Nazism might have been in principle early on, it had now turned against Germany and German interests, and they wanted a decentralized Germany based on Christian values with a very weak central state. It has to be said, it was a really very unrealistic policy that they had. They clashed with the conservative resistance around Gödler, whom they thought were hopelessly reactionary, and Gödler thought they were just dreamers. By 1943, Hitler's army was severely strained and weakened, having opened up a disastrous and bloody second front against the Soviet Union and facing an ever-increasing Allied force that now included the United States. Hitler's generals were now beginning to question his judgment and his sanity. After the decision from Hitler to invade Russia, you have the first forming moments of a new military opposition, of new colonels, 
of lieutenants, of high military officers. Military resistance becomes more and more focused and gains more support the more that Germany starts to lose the war. And as time went on, some generals at least started to have moral objections to Nazi policies, particularly the extermination of the Jews. Ich kam anschließend als Abteilungskommandeur zu diesem neu aufgestellten Kavalleriement und war ein paar Tage da, da kam der Hauptmann Bettermann zu mir. Mit zwei SD-Leuten, Sicherheitsdienst der SS, zusammen im Zug gesessen hätte und die hätten viel Alkohol bei sich gehabt und wäre langsam redselig geworden und hätten ihm geschildert, dass sie 250.000 Juden in der Heeresgruppe Süd umgebracht hätten und wären nun zur Heeresgruppe Mitte versetzt, um diese auch endlich Juden reinzumachen. Sie schilderten ihm im Einzelnen, wie sie das gemacht hatten, das waren allen grauenhaften Einzelheiten, was man damals sonst nicht wusste. Aber so habe ich von den Verbrechen der Nazis gehört. As Hitler's systematic extermination of millions of Jews became evident to more members of the German military, a brave few struggled to reconcile duty with conscience. They know that the overwhelming majority of their fellow German citizens support the regime. They therefore realize that unless they can get and stay in some position in either the civil or military administration, they won't be able to do anything. This is not a government that can be overthrown from below by masses of people demonstrating in the streets. It's got to be the alternative. You have to grab the wheel from the inside. But you can't grab the wheel from the inside unless you're on the inside. And that creates a horrendous moral dilemma for people because you have to participate in some ways in a regime of which you disapprove if you want to be in a position to destroy it. The armed forces, the top brass, had a very equivocal, equivocal attitude towards Hitler. It was a mixture of, on the one hand, the man is losing the war, we have to get rid of him. There was the other attitude that they were no longer able to justify their oath of loyalty to Hitler with their own colleges as Christians. Confronted with the mounting atrocities against the Jews, an impending defeat at the hands of the Allies, leaders of the various military and civilian resistance groups decided it was time to put aside all political and social differences and unite under one common cause. To this end, a meeting was held on January 22nd 1943, at the home of Kreisau Circle member Peter York von Mortenberg. Da kamen dann erstmals vor allem so, so den, die ganz konservativen Widerständler, eben wie Beck und Gördeler, eben äh, plötzlich zusammen mit diesen Sozialreformern und christlichen Utopisten vom Kreisauer Kreis. Und äh, dieses Zusammentreffen ist auch gleich sehr schief gegangen. <lacht> Im Aber, sie haben sich überhaupt nicht verstanden und zum Teil auch nicht gemocht. Trotzdem war das historisch, weil man sich gar in dem ganzen Dissens geeinigt hat, ja, wir werden es tun. Es muss gemacht werden. Mein Großvater war Offizier der Wehrmacht. Er hat mit anderen Verschwörern über die Frage, wie am besten Adolf Hitler beseitigt werden kann, Und, und das war mindestens genauso schwierig, wie es einen, zu einem echten Umsturz des Regimes kommen konnte. Es ging zum Beispiel um die Diskussion, ob man das Führerhauptquartier Wolfschanze stürmen könnte, mit loyalen Wehrmachttruppen, äh, Hitler festnehmen, gefangen setzen und ihm einen öffentlichen Prozess machen, äh, dem deutschen Volk und der Öffentlichkeit zu zeigen, was tatsächlich passiert dann ein anderer Weg gewählt worden, wie man weiß. They come to the conclusion that the only way to initiate a successful overthrow of the regime is to kill Hitler. Because there's no doubt in anybody's mind 
that in the eyes of the overwhelming majority of the population, this is the center. To help form a plan for the assassination of the Fuhrer, Ludwig Beck turned to a team of co-conspirators inside the military that included General Friedrich Ulbricht, chief of the General Army Office, and Colonel Henning von Tresco, who was chief of staff at Army Group Center in Russia. But for all involved, one question loomed large. Just how do you kill the most powerful and protected man alive? In February 1943, the Germans were defeated in the Battle of Stalingrad, which claimed nearly two million casualties. The Russians would soon be advancing into German territory. As far as the German resistance was concerned, the time for talk was over. The time to act had come. On March 13, 1943, Operation Flash was put into motion under the direction of Colonel Henning von Tresco, who was stationed on the Eastern Front. Tresco was both an officer and an intellectual, one who strongly believed that Hitler needed to be assassinated by a German. His immediate superior, Field Marshal Gunther von Kluge, was also supportive of the resistance, but was inclined to be more cautious. 1943, Glückt es dem Tresco, dem 1A der Heeresgruppe, Hitler an die Front zu locken. Weil es viel leichter war, ihn an der Front, wo der Sicherheitskorridor geringer war, wie im Führerhauptquartier zu ermorden. Offiziere dieses Regimentes und des Heeresgruppenstabes sollten beim Mittagessen im Casino Hitler umschießen. Im letzten Moment untersagte Kluge das Attentat. Und es unterblieb. Frustrated by Kluge's lack of nerve, Tresco had a backup plan. With the help of his cousin, First Lieutenant Fabian von Schlabrendorf, he managed to smuggle two bottles of liqueur containing bombs onto Hitler's plane just before the return flight. Unfortunately, the cold temperature inside the plane's storage area prevented the bombs from detonating. Eight days later, on March 21st, intelligence officer Colonel Rudolf von Gersdorf was scheduled to guide Hitler through an exhibition at the Zeughaus in Berlin. And Gersdorf volunteered to blow himself up with Hitler. Unfortunately, Hitler raced through the exhibition at breakneck speed. He was in and out in two minutes, and that was too short for the fuse to be detonated, so that this attempt also failed. One year later, two more attempts were made on Hitler's life. One involved Captain Axel von den Busche. The second was to be carried out by Lieutenant Ewald Heinrich von Kleist, whose father was also a member of the resistance. And then gab es auch Planungen, Hitler by Uniformverführungen ums Leben zu bringen, indem die Offiziere bereit waren, Sprengstoff am eigenen Körper zu tragen und sich dann mit diesem Sprengstoff in der Nähe des Führers in die Luft zu jagen. Alle Versuche dieser Art sind gescheitert. Zum einen deswegen, weil Hitler die Vorführungen der Uniformen entweder absagte oder aber frühzeitiger verschwand. Hitler's erratic schedule made further assassination attempts nearly impossible. Increasingly paranoid, he began to confine himself to his headquarters for his own safety. The security organs around him, especially the SS, uh, made it very difficult for people to get close to him. The assassination plots that occurred over the years point to another element as well. Hitler seemed to have Satan's luck he was able to avoid being assassinated. With time running out and with casualties mounting, members of the military resistance even sought help from the ever-advancing allies. The German resistance, from quite early on, from the late 1930s onwards, made strenuous and repeated efforts to try and alert uh, the allies, particularly in Britain, 
to the fact that there was a resistance. Some of them had very good contacts to people in Britain, quite senior positions. Adam von Trott, for example, had studied at Oxford uh, and had a lot of British contacts. These, on the whole, were not successful. I don't think the Allies took them particularly seriously. The resistance, at the same time as they were discussing the possibility of overthrowing the regime and making peace, they were also leading, many of them, the invasion of five neutral countries in a row. So the resistance, in effect, discredited itself. And nobody thereafter, outside Germany, was prepared to believe them. Another blow to the resistance came from the Allies themselves, when Roosevelt and Churchill called for the unconditional surrender of Germany in January of 1943. Any hopes for a deal with the Allies were crushed. Any German plot to overthrow Hitler meant that they would still have to come to the Allied terms of unconditional surrender, which were political ends which the German resistance were not happy with. The Allies did not want an outcome in which a new step in the back legend could develop as it had after World War I, in which it was alleged that Germany had really won the war until, unle until its own domestic opposition defeated it. So the Allies wanted to make sure that nobody could doubt that Germany was defeated. With little option but to keep fighting a hopeless war, and with civilian casualties and atrocities mounting, the military resistance sought new leadership, someone who could bring focus and momentum to their desperate cause. His name was Lieutenant Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg. Klaus von Stauffenberg was a family member of a very old noble family from Württemberg. His father had been the Lord Chamberlain to the last king of Württemberg, and he was a devout Catholic, and he grew up in the royal palace in Stuttgart, and the family castle in Lautlingen. And so he was really a part of this monarchical tradition. Er hat eine ordentliche Schule in Bamberg besucht, Humanist von der Ausbildung her. Das heißt, er hat Latein gelernt, er hat Griechisch gelernt, er hat sich mit Geschichte und Philosophie beschäftigt. Und er war sicherlich nicht das, was man in Deutschland damals nannte, ein kommissiger Typ. Das war er sicherlich nicht. Er war sicherlich durch und durch Soldat. As students, Stauffenberg and his brothers Berthold and Alexander were fans and followers of the acclaimed poet Stefan Georga. Georga had advocated a German government based on high ideals and intellectual excellence. And members of his inner circle, which included Stauffenberg, even called themselves the secret Germany. It was a very, very tight knit group, uh, and they believed in restoring a morally driven Germany in the Central Europe that would be a sort of moral, intellectual, cultural powerhouse for, for Europe. Raised in military tradition, Stauffenberg had joined the German Army's 17th Cavalry Regiment in 1926, when he was 18 years old. Four years later, he had risen to the rank of lieutenant and also became engaged to his future wife, Nina. Married in 1933, they quickly began to raise a family. Oh, it was great fun. He was loving. He was a very gay person who laughed a lot. I mean, we were raised uh, quite strictly as it was common at the time. And of course, he was part of that system. But we never minded and we loved him very much. The moral forces driving Stauffenberg were unusual and unusually powerful. He considered that the German army was being corrupted by Hitler and Nazism. They were forcing or leading 
the German army to massacre civilians, to carry out atrocities against Jews and partisans and so on. And he said so in 1942. He told several people that the killing of the Jews made the war monstrous and that Hitler must be removed. In fact, he talked to so many people so much about Hitler that things were becoming a little uncomfortable for him in Germany. In any case, he had been a staff officer for a long time and wanted a front line posting. In 1943, Stauffenberg was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and sent to Africa where he joined the 10th Panzer Division under the command of Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. On April 7th, while on a reconnaissance mission, Stauffenberg became the victim of an Allied bomber attack. He was left permanently disfigured. Stauffenberg had been heavily injured and he had lost one hand and two fingers of the remaining hand and one eye. In May, while recovering from his injuries at a Munich hospital, Stauffenberg was visited by his uncle, Count Nicholas von Oechskill Gillenbond, a commander in the German army. A supporter of the conspiracy against Hitler, he convinced his nephew to join the resistance. Since the generals had not achieved anything, Stauffenberg reasoned, it was time for the colonels to get involved. The ältere generation of officers wie mein Urgroßonkel, Generalfeldmarschall von Kluge, hat im Grunde nichts getan, um diesen sinnlosen Krieg, als der schon bald zu erkennen war, zu stoppen und sich auch kaum aktiv an dem Widerstand beteiligt. Das heißt, die Treue, der Eid, hat für diese Generation offensichtlich noch eine andere Rolle gespielt als für die jüngeren Soldaten. Während die Initiative zum Umsturz, zum Staatsstreich von den Jüngeren, den sogenannten Obristen, ausging. Returning to active duty in October of 1943, Lieutenant Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg was sent to Berlin to work at the General Army Office. And he was ready to take action. After 1941, German officers sympathetic to the resistance had been carefully recruited by Colonel Henning von Tresco and General Friedrich Olbricht and assigned to work at the Bendler Block in Berlin, where the General Army Office was located. There, at the Bendler Block, Stauffenberg would be put in charge of Operation Valkyrie, an ingenious plan that would provide for the deployment of the Reserve Army in the event of an invasion or civil uprising. Ironically, it was a plan that had been approved by the Fuhrer himself. And that gave the conspirators the opportunity to use the Valkyrie orders as an instrument for taking over power in Germany. Of course, the assassination attempt was connected with a much larger plan uh, to stage, in effect, a military coup d'etat and put another government in place. That was going to be launched when Stauffenberg transmitted the news that Hitler had been killed. So the stakes were not just killing Hitler as an individual, but also arresting senior members of the government like Goebbels and others who were in Berlin. Many of the conspirators, including the former mayor of Leipzig, Karl Gerdler and Ludwig Beck, would have important roles in the new administration should the coup succeed. Unfortunately, Operation Valkyrie could only be implemented under orders from one man, General Friedrich Fromm, head of the Reserve Army. And Fromm's support for the resistance was questionable. Colonel General Friedrich Fromm was a career officer. He saw early in the war uh, that the German resources were insufficient for a successful completion of the campaigns, especially the campaign against Russia. And in the course of 1942 and 43, he moved closer to a position of thinking about helping to remove Hitler, but he had 
such a high level of self-confidence that he believed that he could manage that alone and that he could control these other people who were plotting against Hitler. June 6th, 1944, D-Day. a massive assault on land, sea, and air. The Western Allies gained a foothold on the European mainland. It was now only a matter of time before Hitler's Third Reich would be overwhelmingly defeated. But for members of the military resistance, D-Day posed an even greater dilemma. Why bother killing Hitler if the war is lost anyway? Da habe ich den Tresco eines Tages gefragt, lohnt es sich überhaupt noch? Daraufhin sagt Herr Bösler, denken Sie dran, 16.000 Menschen werden täglich umgebracht. Nicht fallen, sondern werden von den Nazis umgebracht, Juden und Russen und ich weiß nicht was. Das gilt es zu stoppen und das können wir und wollen wir stoppen. Da war die Sache klar, dass es durchgeführt werden muss und dass ich wieder weiter mitmachte. Die Motivation von Stauffenberg war vor allem, dass er erkannt hat, dass Millionen von unschuldigen Leuten umgebracht worden sind. Das war sicherlich die Hauptmotivation. Das hat er gesehen und das hat er auch wahrgenommen und hat dementsprechend dann gehandelt. The participants in the Valkyrie plot were patriots and idealists, people who saw what crimes were being committed and who became convinced that they must act or they couldn't live with themselves afterwards. On July 1st, 1944, Klaus von Stauffenberg was made chief of staff to General Friedrich Fromm. This promotion would now give him direct access to the Fuhrer. Es gab hier ganz wenige Offiziere nur, die an Hitler herankamen. Das waren entweder, in der Masse waren es Nazi, wie der Feldmarschall Keitel, Jodel und so. Oder sie waren zu feige, um das Attentat durchzuführen. Und endlich kam mit Stauffenberg ein Mann, von dem man wusste, dass er, dass er bereit war, das Attentat durchzuführen, in die Lage es auch zu tun, weil er in eine Stellung kam, in der er mehrmals im Monat Hitler vortragen musste. The decision was made. Stauffenberg would assassinate Hitler. It would put the 36-year-old officer on a path with destiny. It would also place Stauffenberg's life and the lives of his pregnant wife, Nina, and their four children in certain jeopardy. My father didn't want her to know too much, just in case it went wrong. And then she was asked questions, and she, under pressure, she couldn't be able to play the role of the housewife, who's just doing all of the cooking. I think the first reaction was, well, is it necessary? But then when she found out that it was really important to him, she was supporting him and was absolutely convinced that it was right and it was necessary. She asked, uh, how are the possibilities to achieve the thing? And he was, it said, well, 50-50. On July 20th, 1944, Stauffenberg flew from Berlin to East Prussia. By 11 a.m., he had arrived at Wolf's Lair, Hitler's secluded field headquarters. The Stauffenberg had to bring Hitler to Adel and and B had to through the three Sperrkreis rauskommen, punctually. Man drückte auf einen Knopf, da gingen alle Tore zu. Da kam keiner mehr raus. Also es ist so ein Wunder überhaupt, dass der Stauffenberg aus dem Führerhauptquartier rausgekommen war. Armed with two bombs in his briefcase, Stauffenberg attended a staff meeting, where he was to give a status report on the Army's reserve unit. But shortly before the meeting, Stauffenberg was interrupted before he could arm the second explosive. With only 10 minutes in which to act, Stauffenberg placed the bomb under the conference table. 
and excused himself to take a phone call. Ich konnte auch nicht warten, ob, das, ob der Hitler wirklich tot war, was er angenommen hat, weil er musste lebend aus dem Führerhauptquartier rauskommen, um nach Berlin zu fliegen, um dort den Valkyre-Plan zu starten und zu unterschreiben. Having witnessed the explosion from a safe distance, Stauffenberg got word to Berlin that Adolf Hitler was dead. When Stauffenberg arrived back from Hitler's headquarters, he saw that almost nothing had been done to get the coup going. And he marched into his superior officer's office, General Fromm, and told him that Hitler had been killed. And General Fromm didn't believe it and called Field Marshal Keitel in East Prussia to see what the situation was. And Keitel said, Hitler is alive. Hitler and some of his staff managed to get messages through to Berlin. The conspirators not succeeded in cutting off the radio and telephone links. And once these messages got through, then from backpedaled. And Fromm said, you must shoot yourself. The coup cannot take place. And Stauffenberg said, I shall do no such thing. And then Fromm said, you are under arrest. And Stauffenberg said, on the contrary, it's you who is under arrest. After locking Fromm in a nearby office, Stauffenberg and his fellow conspirators initiated Operation Valkyrie. Soon after, Major Otto Raymer was sent to the propaganda ministry with orders to arrest Joseph Goebbels. He did not get very far. And Raymer said he had orders from Bendlerstraße, from the headquarters of the Home Army. And there was also information that Hitler had been killed and that the army must keep order. And Goebbels said he didn't believe that Hitler was killed and put Raymer on the phone uh, with Hitler. And then Hitler said, do you realize that I am alive? And Rehmer said, yes, my Führer. So Rehmer was turned around by Hitler. Major Rehmer was persuaded by Goebbels to move his troops into the army headquarters to uh, quash the uh, um, conspiracy. Utilizing Rehmer's newly arrived troops as a firing squad, General Fromm staged a desperate show of loyalty in order to save his own skin. At just after 11 p.m., within 12 hours of the failed assassination attempt, the general rounded up Stauffenberg along with his aide and two other officers and ordered them to be executed on the spot. For General Beck, the end was less than glorious. General Beck was allowed to use his pistol to shoot himself. He fired one shot that grazed his temple and he was not even quite unconscious, and he was allowed a second shot, but again failed to kill himself. And Fromm then ordered a corporal to give him the coup de grace, to shoot him. At just after midnight, in the courtyard of the Bendler block, Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg his aide, First Lieutenant Werner von Heften, General Friedrich Olbricht, and Colonel Albrecht Mertz von Quernheim were executed by a firing squad. With them went the hopes and prayers of the German resistance. The bomb that went off under the conference table at Wolf's Lair had killed three German officers and a stenographer. Miraculously, Hitler himself sustained only minor injuries. Even more convinced of his almost divine invincibility, he was determined to round up the conspirators and crush them once and for all. Hitler spoke on the radio himself, something that during the second half of World War II, I might add, he did very rarely.
dass sie selbst unverletzt und gesund sind. Zweitens, damit wir aber auch das Nähere erfahren über ein Verbrechen, das in der deutschen Geschichte seines Zweifels sucht. Eine ganz kleine Clique ehrgeiziger, gewissenloser und zugleich unvernünftiger, verbrecherisch dummer Offiziere hat ein Komplott geschmiedet, um mich zu begleiten und mit mir den Staat praktisch der deutschen Wehrmachtsführung auszuhalten. Es ist ein ganz kleiner Glügel verbrecherischer Elemente, die jetzt unbarmherzig ausgerottet sind. Allied intelligence also intercepted a broadcast from the head of the German U-boat service, Admiral Dernitz, to the various U-boats uh, out in sea, a long message uh, which they decrypted uh, early on the morning of the 21st, in which Dernitz described elements of the uh, German armed forces who were involved in the plot. For the Allies, news of the July 20th plot only served to convince them that Hitler was becoming even more isolated and that his inner circle was crumbling. Nevertheless, Churchill and Roosevelt deliberately downplayed the event as little more than proof of Germany's inevitable defeat. There were simultaneously in Berlin and in Moscow and in London and in Washington feelings of fear and mistrust that one will traduce and betray the other. And therefore, they played down the 20th of July and did not make common cause with it. The Allies never got into a position to act on this because before the plot, they were not aware of the extent of it. After it, it was too late to do something about it. Allied propaganda put this down as an internal quarrel within the Nazi movement of no importance at all. I think to admit that this was a serious attempt to overthrow Hitler would have put a question mark over the policy of unconditional surrender. So the speeches by Churchill and the comments by Roosevelt after the event were guarded. If Hitler couldn't achieve victory, he could at least seek revenge. Using Himmler's secret police, he issued orders to arrest all suspects and torture them for information. In July 1944, Baron Philipp von Burselager was a 26-year-old army field lieutenant serving under Henning von Tresco, who had now been promoted to major general. I was only to the attentat because man had to in Berlin the attentat. Absichern. Und möglichst Goebbels und äh, Himmler dabei festzunehmen. Mit 1200 Mann war ich zu einem Sammelort geritten, wo wir die Pferde lassen sollten und mit dem äh, LKW zu einem Flugplatz gebracht werden sollten, um nach Berlin zu fliegen. Und dann ritten wir wieder wie die Verrückten nach Osten, um da, uh, nach dem gescheiterten Attentat damit das nicht auffiel. Das war natürlich an sich sehr auffällig, sowohl für die Soldaten, wie, die da mitritten, wie auch für die Front, aus der wir ausgebrochen waren. Also ich war ganz sicher, dass wir am nächsten Tag verhaftet wurden. Ja, ich bin nicht verhaftet worden, weil ich von keinem der Männer, die mit mir äh, gegen Berlin geritten sind, sich nicht denunziert worden, erstaunlicherweise, von keinem. Der Wille, aus dem Leben zu scheinen, war bei vielen, weil sie befürchteten, bei Verhören, gefolgt bei Folterungen, Verräter von Freunden, Namen, un, ungewollt, aber eben Namen zu nennen. Mein Vater, er hat sich am 8. November 1944 in den Morgenstunden mit einer Pistole das Leben genommen. Wir Kinder sind dort gewesen. Ähm, Er ist dann in den Armen meiner Mutter gestorben. Er war nicht sofort tot. Wir Kinder sind davor bewahrt worden, unseren Vater noch einmal zu sehen. Aber natürlich war ab dem Tag eine neue Passage des Lebens beschritten. Ich bin am Tage des Todes meines Vaters geboren worden. Das heißt, wir haben das Drama dieses Opferweges selbst miterlebt und sind dadurch auch alle 
geprägt worden. Mein Vater war äh, erst in Berlin am 20. Juli und äh, ist dann noch nach Hause, also hierher gefahren. Beim Abendbrot kam also die Gestapo an und dann ist mein Vater aufgestanden, rausgegangen in den Steinflur und der Gestapo-Mensch hat ihn gefragt, sind Sie Graf Hardenberg? Da hat mein Vater gesagt, ja. Dann hat er gesagt, ich muss Sie verhaften. Hat mein Vater gesagt, ja, ich komme mit, aber ich möchte mich von meiner Familie verabschieden. Mein Vater ist in die Bibliothek hier reingegangen und hat eine Pistole, die er vorher schon bereit hatte, aus dem Schreibtisch meiner Mutter rausgeholt und hat sich zweimal ins Herz geschossen. Als er sich schoss, zweimal, ging beide Kugeln direkt am Herz vorbei. Da wurde er ärztlich behandelt. Sie wollten ihn erstmal pflegen, weil sie ihn verhören wollten. Sie haben zu viele Menschen zu schnell umgebracht. Sie hatten niemand mehr, den sie verhören konnten. Among the conspirators who either committed or attempted suicide rather than be forced to name others was Henning von Tresco. On the morning of July 21st, the man who had been both the moral conscience and chief organizer of the military plot against Adolf Hitler blew himself up with a hand grenade. In the weeks and months that followed, hundreds of suspects were arrested. Many were sent to the Gestapo incarceration center on Prince Albrecht Street, where they were subjected to brutal torture an intense interrogation. Some were sent to be tried in front of the so-called People's Court. So ein Schicksal war, dass mein Vater sofort verhaftet wurde, nämlich einen Tag danach, dass man ihm aber offenbar an diesem Tag nichts hat nachweisen können, dass aber nach weiteren Recherchen oder vielleicht auch Vernehmungen anderer Leute, er dann einige Tage später wieder verhaftet worden ist. Dann wurde ihm der Prozess gemacht von Roland Freisler und wie viele andere ist er dann auch zum Tode dort verurteilt worden. Mein Mann er ist Anfang August verhaftet worden. Da war jedenfalls drei Wochen in der Prinz-Albrecht-Straße. Und ich wusste erst gar nichts. Ich hoffte immer, er kommt irgendwie. Und äh, hatte ja immer die Todesangst im Herzen, äh, weil ich von dem Attentat gehört hatte. Und da meldete sich ein Offizier bei mir. Der bekam den Auftrag, Zivilkleidung zu holen bei mir. Und ich war damals ja noch sehr jung, 26 und naiv und habe immer gesagt, ja, aber da gehört doch auch ein Schlips dazu und ein Gürtel. Und worauf äh, dieser Mann mir stotternd immer sagte, das darf aber alles nicht sein. Ich ihn natürlich auch fragte, wie ist denn die Behandlung? Und er sagte entsetzlich. Also das war es, wie ich es erfahren habe bin ich jeden Tag eigentlich zum Bahnhof gegangen, in der Hoffnung, dass mein Mann vielleicht doch äh, irgendwie freigesprochen wird. Und dass er kommt, da hatte dann auch bald Geburtstag. Also zwei Tage vor seiner Hinrichtung wurde er 36. Und ähm, er kam halt nicht. Und ich hörte auch nichts, gar nichts. A considerable number were brought before the courts. They were made to look undignified by not having belts to keep their trousers up. This is a properly constituted court, but of course there's no real defense. I mean, defense counsel didn't, didn't, didn't dare, but tried to defend them. Yeah. 
bin bei Stauffenberg gewesen, um äh, nach der neuesten Nachricht über die militärische Lage mich zu erkunden. Ja. Weil ich Beck nicht erreichen konnte. Da hielt sie von ihm und er hielt eben eine sehr böse Nachricht auch über die Lage im Westen. Ja, und? Daraufhin sagte ich, na dann wird es ja eigentlich überhaupt zu spät. Spät sein. Ja. Verlassen Sie sich darauf, darauf gebe ich Ihnen mein Wort, wir werden rechtzeitig handeln. Denn die sind ja nur noch ein Häufchen Elend, das vor sich keine Achtung mehr hat. The judge, Roland Freisler, was a fanatical Nazi. Und werden Sie hier nicht unverschämt. Mit Ihnen werden wir fertig. Freisler shouted at them, showered them with insults. Wesentlich gedacht an die vielen Morde. Morde? Sie sind ja ein schäbiger Lump. Sprechen Sie unter der Gemeinheit. Ja oder nein? Zerbrechen Sie darunter? Herr Präsident, auf meinem Ja Ort. oder nein auf eine klare Antwort. Nein. Nein, Sie können auch nicht mehr zerbrechen. Denn Sie sind ja nur noch ein Häufchen Elend. Some of them still managed to get in a few jibes. Um, uh, when Freisler shouted at uh, one of them, uh, uh, you, you, uh, you're such a traitor, you belong in hell. And the uh, defendant shouted back, and I'll see you there soon. The trials, which were filmed for propaganda purposes, were little more than a sham. But what followed was an end more grisly than anyone in the courtroom could have imagined. When many of the conspirators were taken to be executed at Plotzensee Prison in Berlin. The conspirators of the 20th of July 1944 were all hanged uh, on specific orders by Hitler. They were hanged with a thin cord slowly uh, in order to prolong the agony. Even General Fromm who had taken it upon himself to shoot Stauffenberg and three of the other conspirators on the night of July 20th, could not escape the Gestapo. He was himself put on trial in March 1945, and he was convicted of cowardice. He should have been convicted of complicity, but that was a service that the judges did him, because then he was shot instead of hanged. For the wives and families of the conspirators, there was little to do but wait and hope. Most knew little or nothing of the conspiracy, but their lives hung in the balance just the same. The adults had tried to keep us away from the radio, and on the next day, my mother then took my next younger brother and me aside and told us that it had been my father who had tried to kill Hitler. I was totally confused. And then my mother said he thought he had to do this for Germany. And that was a difficult thing to understand because basically we were little Nazis, if you like. And of course, there wasn't much time to talk to her because the following night she was arrested and taken away. Nina Stauffenberg was sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp while still pregnant with her fifth child. I was born not very far from here. At that time, my mother was in a concentration camp, which was called Ravensbrück, before that. And then <clears throat> when it came uh, to the time of the birth, uh, she was brought away from the, from the concentration camp to a maternity home. She wrote to her mother from prison to prison. She thought of the possibility not to survive because she wrote her last will in case I'm dying or in case of my death. And then it starts, if it is a boy, it should be named this and this. And if it's a girl, she should be named this and this. And then writing down her wish that she hopes that the children can stay together so that they have at least a feeling of family. The Stauffenberg children, like the children of most of the conspirators, were taken from their mother and put into orphanages where they were given different names. In the middle of September, we were taken to a resort where all children from basically all 20th of July families 
were put together. I was there with the uh, Stauffenberg children. I was there with the Tresco children. We were all there together. In all, approximately 700 people linked to the Valkyrie plot were rounded up and arrested by the SS. More than 200 were executed. But on April 30th, 1945, with Berlin surrounded and bombarded by Allied forces, Adolf Hitler killed himself in his bunker. One week later, on May 8th, Germany surrendered unconditionally to the Allies. The concentration camps were liberated. And a new nation would need to rise from the flames and ashes. Two had claimed more than 50 million lives. For Germany, the effects of the war were devastating. Dozens of cities and towns had been bombed almost out of existence. As a further humiliation, the country was divided into four parts, each under the military control of one of the Allied nations. Deep in the soul of Carl Schmitt has been planted the love of aggression and conquest. And unless that passion is uprooted, 10, 20, or 100 years hence, a new generation of Germans will find a new leader who will show them the way. How shall that be prevented? A sound beginning has been made. This time, things are being done differently. At the end of the last war, German armies parading through Berlin. This time... The legend of German invincibility lies once and for all a shattered myth. After the last war, this was the government of Germany. Today, this is the government. We have come to Germany not as liberators, but as conquerors. But for the surviving members of the resistance and their families, conditions were even harsher. After the Second World War, the people who fought against Hitler were seen by the ordinary German as traitors. They've traded the German people, they've traded Hitler, and they were traitors against Germany. It was very hard in the German post-war society to make a new point of view for these people who were against Hitler. Die Witwen und damit auch die Kinder bekamen keine Rente. Normalerweise war es natürlich so, dass oder wer auch immer, ganz egal, wenn er fiel, dann hat natürlich die Ehefrau eine Rente bekommen. Das war nicht der Fall bei den Männern vom 20. Juli. Meine Mutter äh, wurde ja enteignet. Keine Lebensmittelmarken mehr, nichts zu essen, Geld, Konten gesperrt, keine, kein Geld, nichts. So musste sie also drei Kinder irgendwie durchbringen und durchschlagen. Das ging natürlich nur durch die eigene Familie. Ich selbst habe naturgemäß bewusst davon nichts mitgekriegt, wenn gleich mir die Windeln, glaube ich, am Po festgeklebt sind, weil es keine Ersatzwindeln gab und keine Milch. Also auch für mich als Säugling muss das ähm, sicherlich nicht, oder für eine Mutter, die einen Säugling hat, den sie nicht richtig ernähren, nicht richtig kleiden kann, muss das alles ziemlich entsetzlich gewesen sein. 
Der Widerstand wurde natürlich von vielen Menschen, Bevölkerung der Deutschen, nicht als gut angesehen, sondern im Gegenteil. Ich habe auch Verwandte gehabt, die sagten, das ist Hochverrat eben gewesen. Und wie kann man mitten im Krieg sich gegen den Führer wenden? Und sozusagen also alles verraten. Das musste man halt ertragen. You have to realize that when in 45 Germany lost the war, the liberators were the enemies. And so the Germans sticked together and they stick together uh, with all the old Nazis. Sollten wir den Finger aufheben und sagen, wir, wir will den Widerstand? Nein, das hat man natürlich nicht getan, nicht? Sondern man hat mit seinen Nachbarn zusammen, ob die Nazis waren oder nicht, die Häuser wieder gedeckt, die Häuser in Ordnung gebracht, die Dörfer in Ordnung gebracht, aufgebaut. Als Verräterkinder nun in die Schule gehen zu müssen und aufzuwachsen, ist so komisch nicht. Deswegen fühlte man sich, wenn auch zunächst mal in der negativen Ausrichtung, eigentlich schon immer ein bisschen anders als die anderen. Da die Lehrer selbst ja auch aus dem Dritten Reich kamen und im Zweifelsfall sehr für Hitler gewesen sind, spürte man die Antipathie, die sie, da, die sie gegen einen hegten, weil der Vater ein Widerstandskämpfer gewesen ist. Ich war immer ein schlechter Schüler, sodass meine Mutter viel zu diesen Elternsprechtagen gehen musste, um mit dem Lehrer zu reden. Und ich war etwa 14 oder 15. Und der Lehrer beklagte sich wieder über meine schlechten Noten, kam die beiden wohl ins Gespräch und dann fragte der Lehrer meine Mutter nach ihrem Mann und dann sagte meine Mutter sinngemäß, dass er nicht mehr lebt, sondern dass er eben im Zusammenhang mit dem 20. Juli umgebracht worden sei. Und darauf antwortete der Lehrer dann, ach, das ist ja eigentlich kein Wunder als Sohn eines Verräters. Ich denke, die beeindruckendste Situation, die ich mit oder wir Kinder mit meiner Mutter erlebt haben, war äh, irgendein Weihnachtsabend, äh, dem, äh, zu dem meine Mutter das Gefühl hatte, wir seien alt genug und sie könnte jetzt uns mal die Abschiedsbriefe ihres Mannes vorlesen. Wir lagen uns zum Schluss alle schluchzend in den Armen. Und äh, das von diesem Zeitpunkt an äh, bei mir im Zweifelsfall unbewusst, nicht bewusst, äh, eine innere äh, Entscheidung gefällt wurde, nach Möglichkeit äh, ehrlich, aufrecht und geradlinig zu sein wie mein Vater. Known as the widow of the man who tried to kill Adolf Hitler, Nina von Stauffenberg's life after the war was particularly challenging. We grew up without a father, and my mother had to carry the burden of bringing us up. I think by the time my father died, my classmates had lost their fathers, lots of them already. That was nothing exceptional. Difficult to imagine today, but that was the way it was. I never doubted my father, but somehow that still I couldn't understand why he'd done it. At the time, we didn't realize a fraction of everything that she'd done. And they had done. That took, took a long time. But as resentful as many Germans were of the families of resistance members, a greater suspicion festered between the communist Soviet Union and their democratic allies. In 1948, Russian Premier Joseph Stalin cut off all air and road routes to West Berlin. The Cold War had begun. 
the Americans and the British then organized an airlift, which for many months kept West Berlin going and kept it supplied. When it was surrounded by East Germany, but they still kept it going. And I think that generated a lot of sympathy for Germans. By 1949, the situation had worsened, and Germany was ideologically divided into two separate states. The Federal Republic of Germany developed out of the US, British, and French zones. And the German Democratic Republic was created from the Soviet zone. Ironically, it would be this division that would contribute to a greater awareness and greater appreciation for the German resistance during the war. Some senior conservative historians of the late 40s and 50s uh, began to write about the, the plot and to try and uh, vindicate them and say that look, these were people who tried to rescue Germany's honor. With an eye toward building both strategic and military alliances, the Democratic West and the Communist East each began identifying former conspirators as patriots in an effort to rehabilitate the German public in the hearts and minds of their respective countries. Die Sachlage hat sich dadurch geändert, dass in den 50er Jahren ein Prozess stattgefunden hat, in dem geklärt wurde, ob die Widerstandskämpfer Verräter waren oder nicht. Und in diesem Prozess, der sogenannte Remer Prozess, ist sehr klar gesagt worden, es waren keine Verräter, sondern sie haben letztlich für Deutschland gehandelt. On September 14, 1952, Plotzensee Prison, the place of execution for many of the July 20th conspirators, was dedicated as a memorial to the millions who suffered and died at the hands of the Nazis. For widows like Johanna Rotkins, the memorial served as a place of mourning. Es gibt ja kein Grab. Die Leichen wurden ja sofort verbrannt und die Asche in alle Winde verstreut. Infolgedessen äh, ist das die Stelle, wo ich meinen Mann, also wo er noch gelebt hat und gestorben ist. Das ist mir noch sehr deutlich in Erinnerung. Und wie rührend das eigentlich war. Und am Anfang, wir Witzen gar nicht in der Lage waren, da überhaupt reinzugehen und sich da hinzustellen. Wir das aber gelernt haben, viele von uns, ich glaube fast alle. Der 20. Juli. except for everyone in Germany. But I've never had any doubt that he was a patriot, that he wanted to do the best for Germany. But could the German public's opinion of the conspirators and their families really change? And just how willing would the world be to embrace their former enemies as true friends and allies? Sie haben den Walküre Befehl gegeben. Jawohl, Herr General Oberst. Ohne meine Einwilligung. Sie sind verhaftet. Das Weitere wird sich finden. Herr General Oberst, ich selbst habe die Bombe gezündet. Ich habe sie unmittelbar neben Hitler placiert. Er kann nicht mit dem Leben davon gekommen sein. In 1955, two films were released in West Germany that dramatized the July 20th plot. The first, directed by legendary German filmmaker G.W. Pabst, starred Bernhard Wicke as Stauffenberg, 
and offered a fairly accurate, if somewhat austere, account. The second production, sparsely titled The 20th of July, premiered within weeks of Pabst film. Directed by Dr. Falk Harnack, a resistance member himself, it offered a somewhat more complex interpretation, one which attempted to examine the motives of the conspirators. Meine Herren, ich glaube, wir geraten schon wieder ins Theoretisieren. Das haben wir jetzt lange genug getan. Die militärische Lage nach Stalingrad ist mehr als ernst. Was wir brauchen, ist die befreiende Tat. Sehr richtig. Die illegalen Arbeitergruppen sind von den Generalen bitter enttäuscht. Jahr für Jahr warten sie vergebens auf eine Aktion. Es muss endlich etwas geschehen. Das ist eine gerechte Forderung, Herr Köfer. Wenn wir auch wenige sind, so müssen wir doch die große Fahrt in eine bessere Zukunft beginnen. Sie wird teilweise ein rasendes Tempo annehmen. Es ist aber notwendig, dass sich in Deutschland etwas ganz Neues findet, eine, ein neuer Kern, der zwischen Ost und West ein Leben nach unserem Sinne ermöglicht. The tide had begun to turn. After more than a decade of being decried as traitors, Stauffenberg and his fellow conspirators were starting to be thought of as patriots by the German public. Also am 20. Juli 1954 hat Bundespräsident Heuss, unser erster Bundespräsident, erstmals hier in Berlin eine Rede gehalten, in der er, in dem er als Repräsentant der Bundesrepublik Deutschland Stellung nahm zum Attentat und das positiv besetzte, zum ersten Mal offiziell. Und mit dieser Umkehrung, dass äh, es also nicht äh, kein, kein Hochverrat war, sondern dass wenn wir das in Anführungsstrichen setzen wollen, die Ehre des deutschen Volkes durch diese Widerstandskämpfer gerettet worden ist, als dass das erste Mal wirklich politisch formuliert wurde. Perhaps not coincidentally, it was also in 1955 that West Germany joined NATO. It was a positive step in the divided country's post-war rehabilitation. As the Cold War solidified, there was a sense in the West that they must reconstitute the German armed forces to help maintain the security of Western Europe. It was a very difficult process uh, for the Allies to, to follow because there was a great deal of animosity towards the Germans still for many years after the wars. With the outbreak of the Korean War, it became a matter of interest to the Western powers, particularly America, that Germany contribute to the defense of Europe. The German army could not simply be reconstituted as it had existed until 1945. It needed an honorable tradition. And where to find an honorable tradition? The answer was the resistance. To the people who live in Germany, these are somewhat more uh, agreeable uh, models from the past than military occupation officers <laughs> that were brought in by the British, French, and Americans, to say nothing of those brought in by the Russians. Officers who applied for officers' commissions in the new army had to appear before a commission and had to answer questions about how they saw uh, the resistance and the coup and the plot against Hitler. And if they refused to accept that the conspirators had honorable motives, uh, they were generally ineligible uh, for officers' commissions. Berthold von Stauffenberg, Klaus von Stauffenberg's oldest son, was one of the first to join the new West German army as an officer. I knew, of course, that I had to live with my father's memory, and that I would be asked about him, that I would be compared with him as one of the top 
officers amongst his contemporaries. My father's contemporary would look at me and, you know, is he, is he the same as his father, you know? And uh, that, that's a bit uncomfortable at times, and unnerving. But I survived that, as you see. In 1961, the Soviets erected a concrete wall through Berlin to divide their eastern side from the west to stop the border crossing. But as one wall went up, another came down, as public opinion about the resistors continued to change. It took a very long time for the Germans um, to accept uh, that what had been done by the German people um, has been terrible. It started only in the 60s when the subject was brought to the public attention through the Auschwitz trials in Frankfurt. This is when the question of what had happened really started to be debated in the public and in the media. In 1964, a set of postage stamps featuring Klaus von Stauffenberg was released in Germany. In 1967, the Berlin Senate established a memorial and educational center intended to inform the public about resistance to National Socialism. In the late 60s and, and, and 70s, Social Democrats came to power under Billy Brandt and Helmut Schmidt. And there was a new atmosphere of a much more critical view of the, the German past, uh, and particularly the Nazi past. Das hat sich im Laufe der kommenden Jahrzehnte geändert, Mitte der 50er Jahre bis zu den 60er Jahren, wo in Deutschland das stattgefunden hat, was man nennen kann die Aufarbeitung des Nationalsozialismus. Dort sind zum ersten Mal Fragen gestellt worden an die Eltern, und an die Großeltern, was habt ihr eigentlich während des Krieges getan? Very important for the discussion in Germany actually had been the projection and television of the series Holocaust. Of course, the question of Auschwitz had been discussed in the trials uh, in the 60s, but the series Holocaust showed emotion, showed real people. After each um, series, there was a big discussion afterwards. So that was the moment when something changed in Germany. Until that time in Germany, nobody used the word Holocaust. In 1980, in the courtyard of the Bendler block, the following engraved inscription was placed in the wall near the entrance. Here in the former Army High Command, Germans organized the attempt to overthrow the lawless National Socialist regime on July 20th, 1944. For this, they sacrificed their lives. But as much as the German public had come to embrace the members of the German military and civilian resistance as patriots, there was still a reluctance to call them heroes. The German people since 1945 have justifiably been very wary of heroes. Nazi Germany was a uh, state and a culture which glorified heroes, made heroes out of almost everybody. Of course, with the ultimate hero being Adolf Hitler. Ich bin deshalb vorsichtig mit dem Wort Held, weil man Gefahr läuft, dass man vielleicht einige dabei vergisst. Und dass man Gefahr läuft, nur einige wenige zu nennen, die immer wieder genannt werden und dabei andere nicht berücksichtigt. Gerade in Berlin äh, gab es enorm viel ganz einfache Menschen, Bäcker, Fleischer, simple Leute, die Menschen gerettet haben. I'm sure my father considered himself pretty ordinary. He wasn't Superman, he wasn't the, 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 the hero. Wenn wir jetzt, wenn jetzt unsere Generation so eine Superman Story draus macht, dann entziehen wir uns selbst der Möglichkeit ähm, für unsere eigene für unser eigenes Handeln da irgendeine Lehre rauszuziehen. Das ist so wie 
wie natürlich, wenn man sich mit den Nazis beschäftigt, ähm, man immer die grässlichen, großen, zwei Meter blonden Hühnen nimmt als den Otto-Normal-Nazi. Also diese Klischees, die da entstehen, die behindern, diese ganze Geschichte wirklich zu erfassen. In 1987, in what would prove to be the waning days of the Cold War, US President Ronald Reagan made a monumental speech at the Berlin Wall. If you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Two years later, the wall was finally torn down. It was the first step toward a reunification of Germany. It also sparked a new kind of German national identity. There was a tremendous wave of enthusiasm and pride in 2006 when Germany hosted uh, the World Cup and everything went well. You could see German flags everywhere. Plötzlich läuft die Leute mit der eigenen Fahne durch die Straße und sogar stolz Deutschland, Deutschland ruft. Und dass es viele Männer und auch Frauen gegeben hat, die stolz einen Ring um den Arm trugen mit den Farben von Deutschland. Das war zum ersten Mal ein Signal für die Deutschen, wir sind wieder wer. After his trip to Berlin in 2002, screenwriter Christopher McQuarrie brought the idea of a feature film based on the July 20th plot to his friend, director Brian Singer. The two had previously collaborated on Singer's first feature film, Public Access, and on the highly acclaimed suspense thriller, The Usual Suspects. Chris and I are great friends. We've known each other since we were kids. We made World War II films in my backyard. Growing up Jewish, it's interesting. For me, it was very important to understand the development of the Reich and to understand how that came to be. I think my fascination with the Second World War began with a film I did years ago called Apt Pupil. And I knew that not all Germans were necessarily Nazis. It would be devastating to imagine that the whole of a people could be completely involved with mass murder and such hate. After reading Macquarie's script, Singer signed on to direct, excited by the prospect of shedding new light on a little-known chapter in World War II history. In March of 2007, the filmmakers secured financing for the project, now titled Valkyrie, from United Artists. They also received a commitment from actor Tom Cruise to play the leading role of Klaus von Stauffenberg. There was not a conscious effort to say, we're going to make a story about Klaus von Stauffenberg. But Stauffenberg is far and away the, the, the central character of the drama on July 20th, not only because he delivered the bomb, but because what he was responsible for doing after the delivery of the bomb. He's a character that takes you through the entire conspiracy. As the production fell into place, the filmmakers decided to photograph the period exteriors on location in Berlin. The nice thing about Berlin is that a lot of the buildings that were there during World War II actually exist, and it gives you sort of this authentic feel, and, you know, the key to this whole thing was being as authentic as possible. More than anything else, you shoot in Berlin because this is where the events took place. The city is haunted by so many ghosts, and there's so much about Berlin that still holds on to the war. On July 19, 2007, cameras rolled for the first time on Valkyrie. Pause! Take one more. 
The production was scheduled to shoot for 15 weeks and featured an international cast of acclaimed actors, which included Kenneth Branagh as General Henning von Tresco, Tom Wilkinson as General Friedrich Fromm, and Terence Stamp as General Ludwig Beck. For the filmmakers, accuracy and integrity were key objectives. Tighter lens on Kretz, yeah. and then behind the show. Brian wants everything to be as accurate as possible, which we wanted as well. In certain cases, we had to combine characters, compress time and events, but we wouldn't make a change like that unless it serviced the story and allowed us to get the spirit of what was actually happening. The truth is better than anything you could ever make up. These men tried to kill one of the most evil people who ever lived so that they could save their country, save Europe, and save the world. And so we focused on July 20th and the events of July 20th as the thing we wanted to tell. The story itself is so dramatic and so rich and so real, why wouldn't you tell the story as truthfully as you possibly could? We were guests of Germany while we were there. Great. We got so much support from these people. One more, one more hustle. One day while we were shooting, this woman walked onto set and she broke out a photo album and showed pictures of, you know, uh, Lieutenant von Haften and, and, and General Ulbricht who'd been at parties at this house. And this had been her family home. I called a florist in Berlin that was sending flowers to somebody, and the girl I spoke with told me her name was Von Tresco, and I said, oh, like, Henny Von Tresco. And she said, well, yeah, it's actually, you know, he's, you know, my, my grandfather. It's amazing, and it really opens your eyes to realize they had to do what they did, and what they did really mattered and made a difference. When the time came to film the emotional climax at the Bendler block, the seasoned cast and crew were unprepared for just how emotional the experience would be. It didn't hit me till that moment how important it was to film in that location. This journey had come in some way to a, a, a full circle. We had other authentic locations, but this one, and this is it. After researching the subject matter for so many years, I didn't realize how emotional it would be to shoot at the Bendler block and to shoot the conspirators' execution. Before we started rolling, the whole cast and crew stood around the courtyard. Chris read a letter from one of the conspirators to his family. Perhaps there will yet come a time that will judge us not as scoundrels, but as prophets and patriots. That this wondrous call may give honor to God is my fervent prayer. It's a very personal film for all of us involved, and it is a great honor for me to play this character, to represent the spirit of this man, that they had hope for the future and the beauty and brilliance of this country. It's a very uh, sensitive scene in history, and we're shooting at a place where it occurred. If you could uh, grace this place with a minute of silence, that would be very much appreciated. To be there in, in the place where this really happened, this moment of silence is just uh, incredibly moving. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. For Germany, it's one of the stories of World War II that they can be proud of. We were there to make a movie that told the story in as respectful a way as possible. Not only for the German people, who know the story very well, but for the rest of the world, who do not.
Also der 20. Juli 1944, denke ich, ist in der deutschen Geschichte wichtig, weil er, ich denke, moralisch die, das deutsche Volk in gewisser Weise gerettet hat. Das ist, es sollte vielleicht ein gewisser Stolz sich entwickeln, aber so ein Stolz, dass man immer noch sagt, wir akzept, die, ähm, die Vergangenheit, die wir hatten, mit der haben wir uns beschäftigt, aber ähm, ich weiß jetzt nicht, ob man genau sagen kann, ich bin stolz, Deutscher zu sein. Deutschland kann stolz sein darauf, dass sich wirklich noch, noch äh, da ein Widerstand geregt hat. Und wenn das geglückt wäre, wären Millionen von Toten äh, uns erspart geblieben. Each year, on the anniversary of the July 20th plot, crowds gather at the Plotzensee Memorial Center and at the German Resistance Memorial in the courtyard of the Bentler Block. For some, it is out of respect. For others, it is an act of duty. Of responsibility to history. On July 20th, 1944, a few hundred German citizens risked everything in order to prove that there were still people of honor in their native land. In a desperate attempt to save their nation and to spare the lives of countless others, they gave their lives. To some, the plot may have seemed a failure, but perhaps, more than six decades later, it can be considered a success, one more profound than even those involved could have ever imagined. I hold the 20th of July for one of the most important dates of the Deutschen Geschichte from the 20th Jahrhundert, because it is one of the very few connections to the auch während des Dritten Reiches oder durch das Dritte Reich hindurch einen, ich würde sagen, einen unzerstörbaren Kern von Humanität, den es in Deutschland gegeben hat, zum Ausdruck zu bringen. Das ist auch den Nazis nicht gelungen, ganz zu zerstören. Das Nazi-Regime und der Holocaust und der Zweite Weltkrieg, die werden immer eine Wunde bleiben, die vielleicht vernerbt, aber die mit Sicherheit immer schmerzen wird. Das wird auch im emotionalen Gedächtnis lange Zeit bleiben. Ich finde, dass das Land dabei ist, eine ganz gute Balance zu finden. Also in den Spiegel schauen zu können und den Blick aushalten zu können. In vielleicht 20 Jahren wird es niemand mehr geben, der aus eigener, aus persönlicher Erfahrung von dieser Zeit berichten kann. Aber wir müssen die Erinnerung an den Nationalsozialismus und an den Widerstand gegen den Nationalsozialismus wachhalten. Das halte ich für, für ganz wichtig, weil man so viel lernen kann aus der Geschichte. Ich würde behaupten wollen, dass es in den letzten 30 Jahren große Anstrengungen bedurft hat, um dem deutschen Widerstand zu der Anerkennung zu verhelfen, die wir heute 
in der politischen Öffentlichkeit feststellen können. Insoweit hat der Bundespräsident der Bundesrepublik Deutschland, Theodor Heuss, immer recht gehabt. Das Vermächtnis ist uns übergeben, der Auftrag ist noch nicht erfüllt.